Students, let's talk today about Lecture 3, Agamemnon, Achilleus, and the start of the Trojan War. We'll quickly review what we talked about yesterday regarding Achilleus. Then we'll look, or excuse me, about, was it Achilleus? No, sorry, Agamemnon. Then we'll look at some images of Agamemnon so that we have a good idea of what he looks like. Then we'll talk about Achilleus and the start of the Trojan War. And then we'll be ready to start talking about the Iliad itself. I know we've done so much preparatory work, you're probably champing at the bit. Uh, like a horse ready to race, and yet we haven't yet gotten there. Well, wait, we're about to shoot the mark, and you're going to get to go. Let's talk. Okay, according to Homer, remember Homer is the poet who wrote, or excuse me, first spoke the epic poem, the Iliad, uh, also the Odyssey. He, his Agamemnon, according to Homer, Agamemnon and Menelaus were brothers, not just according to um, Homer, though. Homer, uh, some people think, that what Homer did, if he were just one person, was that he took a bunch of folk tales that were around, sometimes called fairy tales, and that he synthesized them, put them together, and made them into these massive epic works. Some people also suggest that Homer was a group of poets, that he wasn't just one person, and that this group of poets over time did this. Um, you don't necessarily need to know that at this point, but that might help to explain why there's so much repetition and why there are, at times, inconsistencies within the narrative. In any case, Agamemnon is considered the son of Atreus and Irope, and he and his brother, when they're collectively referred to, are called Atreides. Now, why might it be the case that you would know a son by his father's name? Well, you might say, that's very obvious, Mr. Schmid, because we call you Mr. Schmid. Was that your father's last name? And I say, yes, it was. It is still the case very much in our culture that we know people patronymically by their father's last name. Now you might say, what if, Mr. Schmidt, my father took my mother's maiden name and then and changed his name, joined her family, and I'm named for my mother. I'd say that does happen these days, but it's much rarer. It's much rarer, yes. And you're named for your grandfather. Potentially, potentially. It depends on how somebody does it. In any case, it is still the case that we generally identify you by who your father is. And you might wonder why that is. And at the very least, somebody might say that because uh, it is always obvious who your mother is, because she carries you, but, and this is very much uh, something that the Greeks had in mind, there's always, to some extent, some doubt who your father actually is. Because, well, though we have a way to prove it now, at that time, they didn't necessarily have the same capacity. And so, very interesting way of looking at things. In any case, Atreus was the father of both Menelaus and Agamemnon, when they are together, they will be called Atreides. Occasionally, sometimes they will be called Atreides, even when they're being addressed by themselves. You'll see the same thing with Achilleus. His father's name is Peleus. He will be called Peleades at times. And uh, oddly opposite from this, Odysseus will not call him the son, himself the son of Laertes, but will call himself the father of Telemachus, which I think he's doing something pretty interesting there. He's saying something like he's proven himself as a man because he has a son. And uh, that's sort of an interesting thing for him to say. Okay, remember that Agamemnon was the king of Mycenae, uh, now called Mycenae or Mycenae, depending on how you pronounce it, still a place that exists, and that he led um, the largest contingent of ships against Troy. There were around a thousand ships that were sent. He brought around a hundred of them. That meant he brought a tenth of the expeditionary force. He had a lot of the power behind the expedition to Troy. So he's the boss because he's got the strength. Now, remember that he married a woman named Clytemnestra. Remember also I told you a weird mythological story? The Clytemnestra is the half-sister of, who is she the half-sister of? Somebody that we so know sort of well, yes? Helen. Helen. Does anybody recall why she is half-sister with Helen rather than full sister, even though supposedly both of them have a father who's King Tyndareus and a mother whose name is Leda, yes? Uh, she's the, uh, Clytemnestra is the daughter of, Darius and Helen is the daughter of Zeus. Very weird story. And this is not the only time you get a weird story like this. In fact, Heracles has a weird story like this. Theseus has a weird story like this. Leda, the wife of Tyndarius, lay with Zeus on her wedding night when he was in the form of a swan. And then she lay with her husband Tyndarius, became pregnant, had four children, supposedly in two eggs. Two of the children were the sons of Tyndarius. Two of the children were the sons of Zeus. The two sons of Tyndarius were, or excuse me, the two children of Tyndarius, one was a boy, one was a girl, were Clytemnestra, mortal, and Castor, mortal. 
the two immortal sons, supposedly, were Polydukes, big-time boxer, and um, Helen. Now, that's the mythology. Not necessarily what Homer believes, but that's the story in the background. Now, something very sad that I'll tell you is this. We'll meet Helen for the first time in book three of the Iliad, and that's always a big moment because it's like, how do you describe the most beautiful woman ever to have existed? And then I'll tell you something funny. If you ever watch a stage representation or a movie representation of Helen, notice whether the first thing you do is A, find her dissatisfactory, and B, criticize her. Because what do you think anybody thinks the first time they see anybody trying to play Helen, the most beautiful woman ever to have existed? Yes? Nobody can be more beautiful than the most beautiful person. This person doesn't measure up. This actress doesn't measure up. It's a very hard role to play. It'd be like trying to play Achilles. So I thought Brad Pitt did an okay job. I mean, if you can imagine the most handsome guy in the world, probably it's something like a Brad Pitt. Probably it's someone. Do y'all know who Brad Pitt is? Yeah, still around? I don't know who the top actor is in Hollywood now, but he did recently come out with a pretty good move. In any case, in any case, that was one of those weird stories. Uh, also, if I ever tell you the story of Theseus, he supposedly had a father that was mortal, um, Aegis, Aegis. Uh, also, Poseidon. And so sometimes you have a godparent and a real parent. Isn't that weird how we still maintain the idea that we have a godparent and a regular natural parent? You might say that if you had incredible abilities, if you want to give a naturalistic interpretation of this, in the ancient world, people said you came from a god. So they didn't know how you became so incredible. So that's an interesting way of looking at it. All right. All right. Who are the children of Agamemnon? Well, you have three girls, one boy. Iphigenia, Electra, Chrysothemis were his girls. Orestes is his boy. In Greek literature, in later drama, Orestes figures very prominently. Electra, slightly. Uh, Iphigenia, all the time. Iphigenia has two plays written about her by Euripides. Iphigenia at Aulis, where she is sacrificed, and Iphigenia amongst the Taurians, assuming that she was not actually sacrificed by Agamemnon. Oh yes, here's where I told you another story about Helen relating her to Theseus, that she was so beautiful that even before she was at the old, old wedding age of 14, she was abducted by Theseus at 12. It was actually while Theseus went to the underworld with his friend Pirithous to try and steal the queen of the underworld, Persephone, that he got trapped down there with Pirithous, had to wait for Heracles, Hercules, to come save him, and during that time, Helen's brothers came and stole her back. Oh yeah, the sad thing I was going to tell you. In book three of the Iliad, Helen looks out over the, the field of battle and looks for her brothers. And she doesn't see them. And she thinks, must be because they're ashamed. Because probably the Achaean soldiers are saying really terrible things about me and they don't want to hear them. And that's a sad idea. But the truth is sadder. They are already dead. And she does not know it because she has been away from home for so long. And so... Homer does not accept that one of her brothers was immortal. Though I will tell you a pretty story of the mythology. One idea is that since one brother was mortal, Castor, or excuse me, Polydukes, and one was mortal, Castor, when the one died, Castor, Polydukes asked Zeus to give half of his immortality to his brother. And so how that worked, supposedly, is A, they were thrown into the sky, which often happened with Greek heroes, and they became the astronomical sign, Gemini, which means twins in Latin, not in Greek. Gemini are the twins. Uh, but the second account is that Polydukes would get to live on one day and be dead the next, and his brother Castor would get to live on the alternate, alternating days, which is an interesting sort of... I, you'll notice in Greek mythology often you get sort of a gift of the Magi, a catch-22, because even though his brother gets to be alive, does he get to see him? No, and so he has to truly love him because he doesn't get to, to be with him. But he, his brother does get to be alive, which is very interesting. If you love something, let it go or wish it back into existence by giving it half your immortality by praying to Zeus. Okay, good. All right. With the outbreak of the Trojan War, as we were talking about, Agamemnon became commander-in-chief. Why did he become commander-in-chief? Because he had the most cattle, he had the most ships, he had the most manpower. He is the most powerful man, so he calls the shots. A, a little bit of tension that will arrive will be with Achilles, who we'll talk about in just a moment. He is the most physically powerful and gifted man, the best fighter, but he does not lead the most amount of people. So a question, a tension that should arise in your mind is, 
Who do you follow? The most gifted warrior or the person who has the most people at their command? The answer for the Achaeans, at least at first, will be Agamemnon. Follow the guy who has the most people behind him. Very interesting. And we'll talk about that just a little bit. All right. Remember that his brother Menelaus, not quite as rich as he was, only brings 60 ships to his uh, 100. I'll talk a little bit about who brings how many ships and how rich or relatively poor they are when we get to that in book two. All right. This is where we're really getting going today. Now, Agamemnon has summoned a giant army, essentially a navy, of several different Greek nation states together in order to retrieve Helen, who has been stolen from her husband, Menelaus, the brother of Agamemnon. There was an oath that all the former suitors of Helen had sworn to her father, Tyndarius, that if she ever be in peril, they will come to her aid. Now she has been stolen away, even if she went willingly. The story that's told is that she was stolen away from Sparta. And so all of these leaders, all of these kings are now honor bound to meet at Aulis and to set out across the sea, the Aegean, and to fight against these evil Asiatic Trojans, who though they worship the same gods as the Greeks, and though they do speak ancient Greek, um, are slightly different. They are a slightly different people, and they do have slightly different conventions. Though the Greeks will keep concubines, which are slave girls, from conquered cities with them. The Trojans actually allow you to be, uh, it's, it's not entirely clear whether you're allowed to be married to multiple people at once, but Priam, though he will have 21 of his sons by his wife Hecuba, will also have an additional 39 sons. So it looks as if polygamy is allowed in Troy. It seems as if you are allowed to have multiple wives. In fact, he supposedly has a hundred daughters, certainly not all with Hecuba. I don't think she had enough time in her life to have that many children. Uh, you know, so he, if you have a hundred children as a man, you would have to have a very old wife for them all to be with her. Probably doesn't work out. Probably doesn't work out. In any case, uh, something sort of sad, uh, but perhaps just about that, is that um, many of those sons will be killed by Athos. I think he kills a solid 20 of uh, Priam's sons, including the most important one. All right, good. So we're at Alice. We need to cross to Troy, but we need favorable winds. What turns against us immediately, of course? The winds. But why? Well, in this ancient Greek world, often when a physical or natural phenomenon turns against you, like a storm hits at the wrong time, or you don't get water for the crops, the idea for why is that you have somehow angered a god. Ooh. And that's sort of like how we look for causes scientifically, but they didn't have science at that time. Science is only 400 years old, by the way, so it's pretty fast moving and amazing. That said, in this case, they asked a prophet, an old time scientist, who would look at signs to try and find out what was going on. He might see like the wind rustle in the trees, and all of a sudden he'd get an, an idea. And that idea would be expressed poetically, and we would have to interpret the poetic image, and somehow we might get to the truth. And so, who was this seer? I think I have it here. Do I have it here? No, no, no. I'll just let, have you write it down. Here, start writing this. The seer's name is Calchas. And he is the seer for the Achaeans. In fact, he's the seer that first told Agamemnon who he would have to sacrifice in order to get favorable wins. So I guess I'll get to that. He'll also be the seer who tells Agamemnon that he has to give up his war prize, uh, Chryseis, his concubine, in order to make Apollo not mad at him. You're seeing a theme here with Agamemnon. Somehow he angers some god, and then he has to give up something very important to himself because of it. Perhaps that teaches you some life lesson. That when you upset somebody of great power, you often lose something of great value. To yourself. And so, in any case, this prophet Calchas was summoned. What do we do? He reads the signs and he says, In order, Agamemnon, for you to spill Trojan blood, you must first spill your own blood. What does that mean? Well, Odysseus shows up. Remember, he's the most cunning, the most clever of the Achaeans. Very good at interpreting difficult situations and difficult sayings. And he says, Well, that doesn't mean you, Agamemnon. You personally, you must leave. I mean somebody from your family. Oof, that's a tough thing to hear. And actually there is a current Netflix series 
that does uh, that does talk about Troy. I believe it's called Troy. I've seen like half of it, and they do a really good job of showing just how painful that moment is for Agamemnon. Uh, because imagine you're the king of an expeditionary force, and you want to go crush these Trojans and put your name eternally in the stars. Wow, that would make you feel I don't know, pretty inspired. But in order to do that, in order to become immortal for some great deed. You have to sacrifice your daughter. That puts him at odds with himself. On the one hand, he's a king and must leave. On the other hand, he's also a man and wants to be immortalized. But on the third hand, he's a father and has to kill his own daughter to do this. Is it worth it? Well, this was a terrible choice for Agamemnon. And in fact, he had a lot of trouble making it. So do not think that he is totally heartless and cruel when it comes to this. It was Odysseus that eventually convinces him that he must sacrifice his daughter. And then so here's sort of the messed up thing about it. And recall that Agamemnon already had a little tension with Clytemnestra because potentially he took her from her first husband and killed her first child. Agamemnon sends word home that he needs his daughter Iphigenia to come to Aulis. Why? She's going to be married to Achilleus. Now you should imagine how you should feel a mother, as a mother at that point. Your daughter is going to marry the most handsome one of the tallest, most eligible bachelor in the world. How do you feel? Happy or sad? Very happy. You're sort of sad, potentially, because your daughter is going to leave your home and you might never see her again, which is sad, of course, because you would live in very different places and be far away from each other. True. But you'd be very happy because, well, she essentially is winning at life, getting Achilleus. Very much what is not in your mind is the fact that she might be sacrificed so that some men can go to a ten-year-long war so that you both lose your daughter and your husband essentially in the same moment. So, Iphigenia is sent to Alice. At Alice, she's told what her fate is going to be. At first, she fights against it. In fact, there are some representations of her being tied up and looking into her father's eyes and trying to curse him. Ugh. But by other accounts, she actually accepts her fate. Achilleus hears that he has been used in order, his name has been used in order to get Iphigenia to come to Aulis. When he hears that his name has been used in this ruse, in this trick, he becomes offended. And he says, I'll fight against all these Achaeans to defend you, even though they greatly outnumber me and will kill me, most likely. She says, no, 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 noble young man, I accept my fate. If this is what has to be done, and this is what you're all going to do, I'll do it. And I see that I haven't mentioned this yet, but so I'll, I'll loop back around here and say that, what are the reasons that Iphigenia had to be sacrificed? Why is it that Artemis was so upset at Agamemnon? Well, there are three possible reasons. One, and this I think is the most likely, is that Agamemnon was out hunting. Artemis is a goddess of the hunt, so she's the best at hunting. He killed a stag in a grove sacred to her, and thus the stag was sacred to her. And then he boasted that not even the goddess was better than he was. Whenever in Greek mythology time, mythological times, you brag that you are better than a god at what they are the god of, something ter terrible happens to you. Uh, I'll tell you two stories. There was a woman. Her name was Arachne. Do you know a little bit about Greek and Latin roots? What sort of creature is called an arachnid? Yes? Spider, that's right. Eight-legged, articulated, armed things. I know. They freak you out. They naturally freak you out. Maybe some of you have spent, uh, experienced your hair rising. That's, that's actually a prey reaction. It's called piloerection. It's what your cat does when you scare it. It's big, and it sticks its hair out. And, like... and if you're like, why do you move so weird? It's trying to look bigger to you. That's why it moves so weird. That's why you do this. So... That's actually why men wear their hair up, too, of course, just like a rooster. Just like a rooster. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, right? Yes. All right. In any case, uh, these two weird stories. Uh, Arachne. She claimed that she was a better weaver than Minerva. Minerva is a weaver both of plots and of tapestries and clothes. She weaves. Women weaved back then. They were excellent weavers because we didn't have factories for clothes, so somebody had to make clothes, and women were really good at it. Excellent needlework. In any case, this woman, Arachne, challenged Minerva. Minerva is Athena's name in Roman. She, by some accounts, won. By some accounts, lost. But Athena was not happy at the fact that they competed in the first place. 
So she boxed Minerva's ear, or Arachne's ear. Ah! Ah, and it caused her such tremendous pain that ah, she committed suicide by hanging. And so Athena said, hang there forever. And that's why the spider hangs, supposedly. On something that it has woven itself. An even more horrific story, so there was a man, Marcius, who challenged Apollo, god of music, to a music contest. He lost that, and then Apollo flayed him. You might not know what flaying is. That's when your skin is uh, uh, essentially, you know, sort of wetted and then pulled off. Uh, he turned him inside out, is what you should, you should get from that. And so the idea here is, if Agamemnon is claiming that he is better than Artemis at hunting, is probably something terrible going to happen to him. Yes, these gods are rather pitiless. They are not, uh, you should not always think that the Greek gods necessarily have humans' best interests in mind. They are known for being cruel. They are known for being catty. They are known for doing what they want at the expense of what other people and other gods want. And so keep in mind that these gods may be very different from what you think of as a god. All right. As I said to you, and so maybe just write this quickly, whatever the reason, the Achaean fleet could not leave the harbor, and the Achaean prophet Calchas reveals the solution. In order for Agamemnon and the Achaeans to leave Aulis for whatever reason it was that they were kept there, they must spill the blood of Agamemnon, they must spill the blood of Agamemnon's family, they must kill Iphigenia, who chooses herself to allow herself to die. So, ah uh, yes, I should have had you looking at these slides the whole time. As I said earlier, so this will be review, Agamemnon tricked his wife by having her bring their daughter to Alice to marry Achilleus. As I said, Achilleus was offended at being used as bait for the ruse. The hero would have defended Iphigenia against the other Argives. However, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, fortunately for the Achaeans, and perhaps fortunately for Agamemnon, Iphigenia accepts her fate and allows herself to be sacrificed for them. And you might want to wonder symbolically why that might be. Well, think about it. If you are going to spill the blood of others, perhaps if you spill the blood of your own family member first, you are totally 100% committed to the endeavor. Because if you've already sacrificed your daughter, have you already lost one of the most precious things in the world to you? Yes. So if you've already sacrificed something that is of the greatest value to you, in order to go to Troy to defeat the Trojans, what might you be willing to do no matter what? Defeat the Trojans. You might have full commitment to the endeavor. In fact, you might say, Mr. Schmidt, is that why often people in the ancient world would make sacrifices before great endeavors? And I would say, well, think about it. The more you give up for something, the more you want that thing. The more you want it. That's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. And you can look at modern Olympic, Olympians and talk about all the pain they've gone through and all the hard nights and all the time away from their family and see whether it is the case that they believe sacrifice gives them commitment or resolve. Interesting idea. Very different back here. I wouldn't recommend necessarily sacrificing a daughter if you, uh, get really, if you really want something like a gold medal. I'd say it's probably steer away from that. We've seen the results. In any case, oh yes. Though it will be the case that Agamemnon has huge rewards because of this, the Trojans will be defeated eventually. It will not be the case that he gets away from this scot-free. His wife, Clytemestra, will not forget what has been done to this daughter, or her first child, or her first husband. And over this ten-year-long war, she'll have a lot of time to think about what Agamemnon has done, a lot of time to plot. Also, Agamemnon has a cousin who lives pretty near there, who hates him because Agamemnon had killed that cousin's father. Perhaps those people will meet up at some point. Perhaps they will plot together. Perhaps Agamemnon will come home and something terrible will be waiting for him. And so remember, in Greek mythology, nothing or no one ever gets away scot-free. Okay. I don't need you to write that. The rest is all... Uh, yeah. I want to look at some images here of Agamemnon. 
We only have a couple minutes. Here are about five. I just want you to see them because we're actually going to run out of time today. This is the quarrel of Achilles and Agamemnon. You see this in book one. Remember, Agamemnon takes Achilles or Achilles' as concubine. Then Athena actually has to restrain Achilles by grabbing him by the hair. This is a really common motif in art. In fact, I have a couple more of the same thing. See there, Athena holding Achilles back. This is uh, Briseis, the concubine of, of um, Achilles being led by Talthidius and Euripides to Agamemnon. This is again Achilles being held back. Can you see that certain images, certain moments capture people's imagination throughout time? Perhaps it will capture yours. Some people interpret this metaphorically. What is Athena the goddess of? Yes? Wisdom. Wisdom. And so some people think, one moment before we go, some people think that this means that wisdom is holding Achilles back from killing the leader of the Achaeans. Okay, we'll talk about Achilles tomorrow.